there it goes. All right. Um, so last week, final notes, or last week, last lecture on plasticity. So I had shown basically that there was the ones that you should know and that you should know the equations for, uh, shown a Tresca condition, a Max, a von Mises condition, um, and shown the two failure surfaces for those, von Mises, and this is a Tresca condition, um, where in stress, uh, in principal stress space, where now the basic idea is you have some set of principal stresses, you can plot those principal stresses in this space and say if you have some stress on the inside of a, of a plastic surface, this survives, and if it's on the outside, then it fails. And this surface is basically that, uh, for von Mises, it's that quadratic equation, or for the Tresca condition, it's that, that uh, maximum shear condition uh, set equal to this surface is the yield surface. So the one final note that I want to point out is that these surfaces generally exist in 3D space. So this is a nice simplified representation, and I had shown the, the 2D versions of those equations, but most of the time when you deal with actual stress states, that this isn't just a 2D projection surface, this is actually a 3D thing. So the von Mises surface is actually a cylinder that goes in space. Um, the, where this is sigma 2, sigma 1, sigma 3, uh, and the Tresca surface is actually a, a hexagon that goes through space. Because if you remember for our von Mises condition, we said we're, we're taking away the hydrostatic part of the loading. So the hydrostatic part being where sigma 1 equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3. So this cylinder is oriented along that 1, 1, 1 axis. So where sigma 1 equals sigma 2 equals sigma 3. That's the center of this cylinder. And if you have hydrostatic stress condition, you can apply under this failure condition infinite stress as long as it's hydrostatic and the material will never fail. Practically, that may not actually be the case. Um, I mean, you can't apply an infinite hydrostatic pressure and expect your material not to fail, uh, which is then where other failure surfaces come in that can then cap these off or expand them or, or close them in, in 3D space. Um, I don't actually expect to actually test you on 3D stress space surfaces, but it's important to kind of be thinking about. So to help illustrate that a little bit better, I'm going to switch to, I saved my thing to you drive this time, uh, so I could actually go on here. Uh, of course it's going to do this dumb thing though. Oh no. There we go. Unfortunately I don't have a mouse. Um, nah, it's fine. This will be a two second demo. So this is now a cylinder in three dimensions. That's basically, uh, this axis would be the sigma one, sigma two, uh, and sigma three axis, the principal stress axes. Um, if I look now along the diagonal, this forms a cylinder going through space. Uh, that hexagon that's in there is the Tresca uh, surface. And if I then take a slice of this, the 2D slice in the XY, or the sigma 1, sigma 2 plane, we end up back at that von Mises surface and that Tresca surface. So this is, like, we're looking at that slice in space of this three dimensional failure surface. And so this is a nice way of visualizing it because it's easier to picture things in 2D than it is in 3D. Um, but this is kind of what I want you to keep in your mind. Um, as like a general idea that, that these failure surfaces are three-dimensional failure criteria. Um, and this is a nice simplification that makes it easy to solve problems and kind of conceptualize a little bit better.
Okay. Cool. Questions on plasticity before we move on? All right. Cool, cool, cool. So now we're going to start thinking about beam bending. So, beams uh, are kind of one of those engineering tools that, that stru for structures engineers love to use. There's, uh, so the, the theories we'll, we'll talk about have been around for, I think, a, couple hun a few hundred years. So we'll talk about the Euler-Bernoulli beam theory today, which has been around since about 1750. Um, but I think it was, it's kind of, used now everywhere in structures and in finite element analysis and um, kind of all sorts of mechanical design. Uh, it's one of those nice simplifications where we can assume a material now is one dimensional uh, if it's if the long and slender enough structure. Uh, and basically what we're trying to do is find if I, if I have some beam doo -doo -doo, that I'm then applying some force to what is the uh, is the load deflection relationship ship um, so this is um, if I have some force F actually I can make this a little bit more general um, I don't want to go into this. Yeah. We'll go into that afterward. So um, this is for a given load on the body on some beam with some arbitrary cross-section. Uh, I'm going to define a couple directions now. Uh, my axis along the beam will be my x-axis. My axis down. Um, the, the axis of deflection will be my z-axis. And here, my cross section of the beam. Do, do, do. I have some centroid, which is my uh, center of mass, effectively, of the beam. Uh, here now, this is my z axis. So this is rotated 90 degrees toward the plane. And this is my y axis. Um, so I want to find if I have some arbitrary cross section beam how it deflects based on the force that I'm applying to it. And that's kind of the goal for beam theory. Um, on top of that, once I can figure out the load deflection relationship, I also want to know what is the stress in the beam. So these are kind of the two important quantities that you're pulling out of this beam theory. It's with some force, how much does it deflect given the boundary conditions? And with that force and those boundary conditions, how much stress is in there? Um, so does this look familiar? Have you gone through some of this stuff before? OK. I'm just curious, the Y is that inner coat? Uh, te technically, it would be out. Okay. So if we did right hand rule, yeah. Y would be pointing. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the Y axis is pointing out of the board in this case. So this would be rotated that way. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, just for clarity, so Y is pointing like out of the page? Yeah. Why is, why is pointing out of the page here? Yeah, you can do. It. <laughs> yeah, so just just on the convention that we have here, x x would be facing out that way, y curls in, and then z points down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
so we'd be we'd be looking at this sir this face and kind of turning it down this is that where this is that cross section uh not if we're looking at the this face of it So there's one of the most famous beam theories, which is kind of if you've done if you've seen beam theory before, most of it was probably based on this. Uh, it's called Euler Bernoulli beam theory. So Euler Bernoulli beam theory, and this. Uh, was developed in around 1750, so it's been around for a few hundred years now. Um, this was uh, Leonard Euler, who, if you've ever taken a math class, which I'm assuming all of you have, his name pops up everywhere. Um, Bernoulli, there was a big family of Bernoullis, actually. So the most famous Bernoulli theorem is the, the fluids equation, Bernoulli's principle. Um, that was actually a different Bernoulli, but this was, I think, his one of his grand great great grandchildren or great grand nephews or something. There there's like a big family of Bernoulli scientists and there's like twenty of them. Um, kind of all mathematicians and theoreticians throughout history. And they have a whole bunch of stuff named after him. So uh, anyway, side tangent. Uh, so the idea behind o Euler Bernoulli beam theory is we have a slender beam. So we have a beam that's very long relative to its thickness. Um, so some dimension h, let's say, and then some length l. Uh, and basically, h over l has to be very small. There's not really a hard and fast rule for what defines slender, but a good approximation um, is when h over l is approximately less or less than or equal to 0 0.1 nah. approximate. Um, so if it's like a 10 to 1 aspect ratio beam, then Euler-Bernoulli theory reasonably applies. Um, if this isn't the case, then you have to go to more complicated theories, um, like Timoshenko beam theory, where uh, Timoshenko was uh, an engineer, uh, actually a professor at UMichigan for a while, um, but basically one of the most famous solid mechanicians of all time. And the big solid mechanics award in the field is the Timoshenko medal. So he's kind of uh, one of the big deals, but I won't get into Timoshenko beam theory here. Um, but the idea behind Euler beam theory specifically is <coughs> something that they call uh, plane sections remain plane. So what that means is when I take my beam and I deflect it, do, 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 uh, pull it down, um, if I were to draw lines along this beam, then all of these sections in the beam if they started at 90 degree angles, then they stay at 90 degree angles. So they deflect along with the beam. Um, this is opposed to, if you remember, uh, say we had a short, uh, a short beam, or not even a beam, a short block like this, and we applied some shear stress to it, it would deform like this. Um, and this section here, something that started at 90 degrees, would no longer be 90 degrees. So basically the, here the beam we're assuming is slender enough that the shear that's acting in the beam, because there is some shear force acting downward, 
um, isn't sufficient to dif distort the structure like this. So all of these plane sections, as the beam deforms, kind of go along with the neutral axis. And that's the, the general mathematical assumption that goes into Euler-Bernoulli beam theory. Um, but the kind of hand wavy Euler-Bernoulli the theory applies is when you have this kind of high aspect ratio beam, like a 10 to 1 aspect ratio beam. Um, so with Euler-Bernoulli theory, there is kind of one big governing equation that defines when, once you make this assumption and you set up the conditions for a beam and bending and moment curvature, um, there's one governing ODE that kind of defines all of the deflection of a beam. So there's one governing ODE that is, um, well, technically d squared dx squared. Um, Oh, maybe I should define some of this stuff first. I'm going to do that. So, let's set up the general case of a beam. Apologies. So, this is, if I take a beam, this beam starts with a neutral axis along here that neutral axis is then going to deflect down. And I'm going to say if I have some arbitrary loading on the surface where this load I'm going to call Q of X. So most of the problems you've seen have probably been point loads on beams. So either a single point force at the end of the beam or three point bending in the middle of the beam. Um, this is a more general definition of it, but kind of show how that simplifies. Um, here, this is the x direction, and what we're looking for now is the deflection w in the x direction. So we're looking for, if I, if I apply some arbitrary loading q to this beam, how much does it deflect w downward? Um, or I guess here, in the positive z direction. Um, and so Euler-Bernoulli theory states there's one governing ODE describing all of this behavior. Okay. Governing ODE uh, and it is d squared dx squared <coughs> ei d squared w dx squared is equal to q of x. So q here is our load on the beam. Uh, e doo, 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 is our Young's modulus. Young's modulus. Uh, I is similar to the J we had for torsion. It's, a, it's an area moment of inertia. Inertia, which Specifically, I is equal to the integral for for a body here, uh, the centroid um, y z. Uh, the integral of z squared d z d y for the this is the moment about the y axis. Um, so how, how difficult it is to to rotate this body about the y-axis. Um, this is the general formulation. There's only a couple that you need to know. So I for a circular beam is pi over 4 r to the fourth for circular beam um, I is bh cubed over 12 uh, for rectangular beam where this is a beam of width B by height H. And so basically this is a 
this i is a metric for how difficult it is to beam around this axis, around the around the neutral plane. Uh, this governing ODE, technically this is the formulation for most materials, most cases, these E and I are constant. So you notice if I'm taking a derivative with respect to X, I'm looking for the change in W along the axis here. Uh, here, if you do have a changing E and I, if your beam is changing cross-section, um, then this is the correct formulation. Most of the time, we simplify beams and we have uniform cross-section beams with uniform uh, elastic modulus. And then this simplifies to uh, E, I, D to the fourth, W, D, X to the fourth is equal to Q of X. So from this ODE with a given set of boundary conditions, you can basically figure out the deflection of any Euler-Bernoulli beam. Um, here, the most general case, which you can kind of how you can visualize this um, with maybe a very practical example is, is a wind turbine blade. So if you have a wind turbine blade um, that has some wind load being applied to it, basically that wind load is a, is a non-uniform load along the length of the beam. So this would be like that Q. And then you need to figure out how much that is gonna deflect for a given wind load, for example. So that would be, and that beam then has a non-uniform cross-section with non-uniform properties along its length. Um, so it's kind of a complicated bending problem. Most of the time you would actually solve that with finite element, but hypothetically you could solve it with this sort of equation uh, or this sort of formulation. But that's kind of the general case. Um, I'll go through and simplify this down a bit and define a couple equations around it. So, uh, here. Okay, so starting from our, our general ODE, we have again EI d to the fourth W, dx to the fourth is Q of x. Uh, I can define a couple material properties or a couple constants from this. I can say Q is equal to negative EI d cubed w dx cubed, where this is now a shear force in the beam. So let's draw, uh, if I have a general deformed beam element here, uh, da, da, da. let's draw that this way. Inside this beam, uh, there'll be some bending moment M, some shear force Q. Oh, how did I script a Q that badly? Uh, Q, and then a counter moment M. So this Q, there's kind of a shear force internally, and I'll show you in an example in a minute where this comes from in terms of uh, boundary conditions or in terms of the applied force. Um, we have a bending moment here. So that bending moment is the most important thing to get from uh, for your stress is also negative EI D squared W DX squared. Um, so here the bending moment directly relates to the deflection of the beam in an Euler Bernoulli beam. Um, based on this relationship, uh, we can define an angle, a deflection angle, is equal to dw dx. So this is uh, bending moment. Uh, we can define some phi, uh, which is the deflection angle. Angle or small deflections. So again, these assumptions are, are assuming not only a slender beam, but a linear elastic small uh, beam. So small or linear elastic small deflections beam. So slender and small deformations. Um, 
Yeah, and so these are some general definitions and what we get from those. Two, two, two. Let's jump over to this. Uh, so the most important quantity for determining stress in a beam. Shear or stress in a is this moment. So this is hopefully somewhat familiar. Let's draw a big beam cross section, some neutral axis. So uh, some bending moment to this thing. Define this as a stress. This is now my z position. Uh, let's define z downward. Positive z, which I guess still is fine. Um, now, another major assumption that goes into Euler theory is around the neutral axis of the beam, around that center of mass of the beam. Um, there is no deformation. So that along with these plane sections remaining plane, um, there's no stress in this neutral axis. So what our stress profile ends up looking like is in the elastic regime is something like this. So we have here now stress acting out not formally on one side of the beam, there'll be a tension and on the other side of the beam, there'll be a compression. And in the neutral axis, there will be nothing. Um, the stress then relates to that moment. Stress is equal to m z over i. So m, we're pulling out of our general deflection equation. Um, or if you're applying a moment, then you get it from there. Uh, z now is the distance from the neutral axis. So z, z equals zero is kind of right here in the neutral, the center of the beam. Um, and then i again is that area moment of inertia. So the, the resistance of the beam depending. Um, so there's also in this beam some shear stress due to that shear, that q, that shear force acting in here. So you can say that there's some shear stress Q over the cross-sectional area, but this is generally much smaller than the stress due to uh, bending, than sigma, than the tensile and compressive forces due to bending. So generally we ignore it. Technically also, if you remember some of our, some of our full 3D stress strain formulations, constitutive relationships. There would be shear stress in through directions, axial stresses in, in out of plane directions. All of those in this formulation we're going to ignore. So we're going to say the dominant stress in the beam, that stress due to bending, is due to that moment and it changes based on the position in the beam. Um, hopefully this equation looks familiar. Yeah? Okay. Does this, have you seen this formulation of it before? Some, yeah, no. Yeah. Uh, I was curious for the deflection angle, where did the I go? Or, uh, or why it's not there? Here, this is actually, we're not taking derivatives straight. Um, this is, this would actually be a geometric thing. So um, when you, when you have that deflection, it would be the angle Technically, it's the, the tangent of P is equal to the deflection in, or the amount of deflection there. And then with a small angle of approximation, it becomes this. Um, so it's not actually defined from the, the general ODE formulation. Uh, it's, it's more of a geometric thing that we're pulling out. Yeah. OK. So uh, for the, uh, the center of the uh, material, the center of the beam, what is this? 
so in the center of the beam, the stress should be zero un under this simplification. Um, as to how true that is, yeah. But with, with this Euler-Bernoulli beam theory, we're assuming the stress in the neutral plane is zero. So stress at z equals zero is zero. And so the stress max, uh, sigma max in the beam uh, is m z max, so the maximum distance from the neutral axis over i, which if you have a uniform cross section like a rectangular beam, it would just be that h over 2. Or if it's a circular beam, it would be the radius. OK. Yeah. 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 And I'll show, oh, I'll, I'll get through one example. Um, but I'll show uh, in an example that I'll probably get through next week that the, it's much, much smaller. Um, OK, so starting from this general formula, we can then figure out the, a general equation defining beam deflection. So starting from this EI uh, d to the fourth w uh, dx to the fourth, I'm going to write this as EI w of x. We're here. Have you seen this notation with apostrophes? Maybe. OK. This is just a faster way for me to write it. But uh, and a, each apostrophe is a derivative here uh, is equal to q of x. Now if I start taking integrals of this thing, I can say uh, EI w the third one of x is equal to c1 plus the integral of q of x dx um, ei w double prime of x c1 x c2 plus second integral of q of x uh, ei w prime is c1 1 half x squared c2 x plus c3 plus the third integral of q of x and then ei w of x or let's write just w of x um, is equal to 1 over ei this is now 1 sixth c1 x cubed c 1 half oof, 1 half c 2 x squared c3 x c4 plus the fourth integral of q of x uh, and so this one equation is a general form is a general solution to beam bending so if if we have some applied q here on the surface um, you can then integrate this thing out if you know boundary conditions at different steps, then you can figure out what these constants are, plug them in, and get a, a general deflection equation. Um, and so now I'll, I'll show an actual example of, of how we go about calculating that. So all right, first, questions, concerns? Cool. So um, <clears throat> there's. In your lab next week, you'll be doing three-point bending and four-point bending. And so I think on Monday, I'll go through those derivations on how you get the general formulas for that. Um, but for most engineering problems, kind of the, the biggest one that people like to assume is that we have a cantilever beam with a point load applied at the end. And so if you've seen formulations for beam bending, then this is probably the one that you've seen. Uh, da, da, da. Example can't can't be for beam. So for this, I'm going to say I have some beam 
with a fixed boundary condition at the end here, and I have some applied load P at the end. This beam has an initial length L and a square cross section or a rectangular cross section with dimensions B and H. So now the trick is going to be figuring out what our boundary conditions are and how to use that to solve our general deflection. Um, so for this Q, things are going to get weird if we try to, technically this is a Dirac function because um, it's a point load at the end. I'm not going to do it in that way. I'm going to say if, if there's a point load, uh, there's a point load, ignore Q, uh, go straight to shear force. So here now, um, basically I can, I can now figure out Q with a force balance on this beam. Um, I know there's some load P here at the end. If I beam and cut it off at some point, there's some P here. Uh, there has to be a balancing P internally in the beam. So just based on a force balance in the Y direction, um, that P doesn't change in there because it's a point force on the end. So I can say my Q is actually just a constant. Um, Q is a constant P everywhere in this beam. Uh, Q, and this is Q of X. So that means uh, now in this formula, I'm going to ignore that Q of X, and I'm going to say uh, E I W triple prime of X, which if you remember, this uh, is equal to negative Q. So this is now just equal to negative P, which is our, our C1 from our formulation up here. Do, do, do. Make sure I'm doing this right. Okay. Um, so now I need to think about what my boundary conditions are. Let's pull this up a little bit. Here, at this fixed end, at the end here, you know there can't be any deflection. So you know the deflection W at this point zero, X where zero starts here, X equals L is the end of the beam, W at zero is zero. You know because it's a fixed boundary condition, um, then there also can't be any deflection. So W prime of zero is also equal to zero. Because now there's a free boundary at this end, you know that there can't be any moment counterbalancing it. So here, if I drew kind of an infinitesimally thin slice, um, the moment here at the end, I, I wouldn't. There, there's no. Uh, there's there's nowhere to apply a moment here too. So the moment at the end has to be zero, which then the moment relates to the second derivative of W at the end of the beam is equal to zero. So these are our, our three, well, so we're getting one boundary condition here, or one stress Q uh, from the load that's being applied in this beam. And so we say for our first equation here, we can figure out this first unknown C1 from this equation. Um, and then our other boundary conditions kind of pop out here. So this W at zero boundary condition goes to our C4 being equal to zero. This one goes to our C3 being equal to zero. Our W double prime at L equals zero. So this um, now is from our formula before one over EI uh, C1 X plus C2, which is then that means C1 L uh, which, sorry, our C1, you remember, is minus P, 
Uh, so now minus PL plus C2 is equal to zero. So our C2 uh, is not equal to zero. C2 is equal to PL. So I can take these, plug them all back in to our equation. Uh, I have just enough time to finish it up. Um, I can take these, plug them back into our general W equation, and say now uh, W of X is 1 over E I. Um, I now have that C1, I have 1 sixth P uh, minus P X cubed, uh, 1 half P L X squared or I can simplify this a little bit and say this is px squared over ei uh, 6 ei this is now 3l minus x for our general deflection of the beam so this is now the, the equation for the deflection of a cantilever beam starting with a point load P here at the end. Um, and this is defining that W of X, how far down it's being deflected. We can go and say our W max uh, happens at L. You could say that by kind of just looking at the situation or you could take a derivative of this thing, um, which is then equal to P L cubed over two E I two E I three E I three E I. Um, the max bending moment you can go back you can calculate from your W, um, but I'm not going to go through that. You can also do a force moment balance. Um, so the maximum moment here, uh, max Max moment is oh, is the moment at zero, uh, which is actually just equal to PL. So the force times the length of the beam, because force times length is our torque. So kind of if you if you actually went through and plugged stuff back into our equation, took some derivatives, you'd end up with that. Um, but I don't want to go through that whole derivation, which now means our stress max. Um, is equal to PL. There'll be a tensile because it's a it's a rectangular beam. There's some now tension and compression on happening there. Uh, PL the max distance here is h over two, and going down it's also h over two. So PL h over 2 um, over i, which our i for a rectangular beam is bh cubed over 12. So this can then, if I plug this into here, oh, then this simplifies out to 6pl over bh, 2bh squared. So now I can say the max stress in tension and compression are equal, uh, and tension on the top side is 6PL over BH squared, and the bottom it's negative that. Um, so, Serwin is here, uh, he this has... This is section A, um, this is the section A lab. I haven't uh, input the, uh, the scores for the rest of the section, so I'm just going to give the A part. And also next time you guys submit the lab, make sure you put your section on your section on because it's now it's like everything is mixed up. I need to separate it first. And then, but I appreciate if you put your section number next time.